yesterday, I made a uh, rather long-winded presentation about um, the Big Bang. Yeah, you know, the exciting stuff. Not the uh, TV show, but the, the real thing. The, uh, the concept developed by George Lemaitre uh, that uh, was uh, mocked and given the name the Big Bang at some point, which stuck. Uh, in actuality, Lemaitre's notions and uh, the presentation that he made in a paper in 1927 uh, described something quite different from what we come to imagine as the Big Bang. Now let's talk about Lemaitre. He was a Jesuit, and uh, the Jesuits are sort of uh, the, um, well, let's give a British example on home soil. Uh, the Jesuit would be the MI5. Uh, and uh, in the United States, uh, they'd be the FBI. Uh, but they also do overseas work so that's MI6 or SIS in Britain and uh, yeah, the CIA and about 3,000 other government agencies that the United States has that we don't know about that do secret spy stuff. But that's beside the point. We're here to talk about the Maitre. And guess what? I'm also here to talk to you about CPT. What does Lemaitre have to do with CPT, you might ask? Well, that's a potent question. Uh, well, uh, let's start with Lemaitre's concept. Uh, first of all, let's return to Jesuits here. Lemaitre is a Jesuit, and you see him uh, in photographs of him, you know, with Einstein and other uh, big names in physics, uh, uh, you know, in the Berlin through Prague through Bratislava to uh, Vienna railway connection that they had going there uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, rather boring train ride, by the way. <laughs> it's largely over flat land. Uh, you take much more interesting routes uh, to reach uh, Vienna from Berlin uh, that pass through much more scenic parts of uh, what was then Bohemia and Moravia and uh, uh, side tracks? Railway tracks, yes. Railways, trains, journeys. Um, one other detail, ah, skip it. Back to the Maitre. Wearing priestly garments in pictures with Niels Bohr and, you know, others uh, of the field. Uh, there was a group of them. Uh, and. Uh, so, uh, Jesuits don't dress like this anymore, by the way. They're, they're like plains clothes, plain clothes dudes. I think the only time they wear their priestly garments is when they have to, uh, you know, uh, go to do their priestly duties, whatever they, they might be. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but that, that's neither here nor there. The major primordial business that we're talking about here, the primordial Morgul Adam. What was he talking about? Well, he wasn't talking about a gigant gigantic explosion that uh, took place at the beginning of time uh, that, uh, you know, came out of, you know, an intensely packed, uh, massively uh, uh, dense tiny uh, particle that, you know, exploded. Uh, don't think so. It just doesn't seem to um, uh, fit. No, what Lemaitre was describing was something very, very primordial indeed. He was talking about the emergence of a quantum fluctuation in nothing. That is to say, prior to space, there was nothing. And then there was a quantum fluctuation and space was created. Why? Well, because that little quantum fluctuation 
made space. Had to make space because the fluctuation released a lot of energy and that energy had to go somewhere. So it's pushing against nothingness and creating space. And this is an energetic space that it's creating, by the way. And the more energetic uh, it becomes, the sort of, <laughs> you know. Uh, we talked about that uh, in the Higgs field. Uh, the, the fact that space has got a residual charge throughout. Uh, uh, but so, this is what happens. You've got a quantum fluctuation that occurs trillions of years ago, perhaps. And over time, it slowly grows. Now, it's growing because quantum fluctuations occur in space. We don't know how the first one occurred in uh, nothingness, but quantum world, it's mysterious, but in empty space, quantum fluctuations are occurring all the time, they're very tiny, uh, and one of the things that they generate is a particle-antiparticle pair, say in normal conditions, say everyday conditions, space is very empty, there's nothing around, uh, uh, and a quantum fluctuation occurs. So there's nothing to interact with this fluctuation. So what happens? In the normal course of events, uh, a particle-antiparticle pair are released. Now, according to prevailing wisdom in physics, this is allowable, but only if they quickly annihilate one another. I think that's actually pretty rare. Because the truth is, the particle-antiparticle pair emerge out of a quantum fluctuation. And then the particle goes forward in time and the antiparticle goes backward in time. And they are separated temporally, like that. The antiparticle goes back into time and eventually reaches the beginning of time, where it collides with all of the other antiparticles that are moving from wherever they are in space back in time to the beginning of time. And what is happening as a result of this? that beginning of time is growing in magnitude. So something that started as a quantum fluctuation perhaps trillions of years ago uh, is starting to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And yes, what that implies is that as the universe ages, as it expands, the beginning of time, that tiny quantum fluctuation at the beginning of time, grows and grows and grows. It's becoming the Big Bang that we consider today. But it didn't emerge as a Big Bang. It just happens to be one now, in the past. But if you move back in the lineal, linear past, truly, you go back to the point where there's nothing and there's just a tiny quantum fluctuation. That is a concept that I can embrace, and that is the concept that underlies uh, CPT. Most specifically, time reversal. Now, as uh, I've mentioned, time reversal was pretty obvious to Feynman when he was doing his diagrams. And I encourage you to study those diagrams, particularly if you like to look at schematics, electronic schematics and stuff like that. The Feynman diagrams are not dissimilar. In fact, the Feynman diagrams are two schematics what quantum chromodynamics is to the standard, the CIE 1931 standard model of color. They're basically one and the same, and that's not because there's any property in quantum chromodynamics that refers to color in any way. It's just so happens that the relationship between uh, parts of the model fit very well with uh, 
our understanding of how color works. That is, you have opposite colors that are complementary, and that is the whole idea behind chromodynamics. So we're going to adopt this system of understanding for quantum chromodynamics. Boy, have I got an off topic. But if you're interested in photography, study quantum chromodynamics. You won't understand it, but boy, it will really illuminate uh, your understanding of color. So, back to Lemaitre and the emergence of his primordial atom. Uh, he had some opponents, but he also had some strong evidence coming his way because his 1927 paper was followed in 1928 uh, by the announcement by Edwin Hubble uh, that he had discovered that the universe was indeed expanding. Now, Hubble didn't make this discovery himself, you understand. Uh, he was busy hobnobbing and smoking cigars and maybe looking through a telescope and sleeping a lot. Uh, no, he had researchers to do that, and uh, uh, so there, there was someone behind the scenes who, you know, figured things out and uh, came up with uh, uh, something that we refer to as a Cepheid variable star. Uh, this all came out of the same research wasn't done by Hubble, although he took credit for it. I'm sure he had a hand in it, but it was largely done by uh, human computers. That is, mathematicians, generally women, and in this case, one woman in particular, who did come to the realization that the universe was expanding based on her analysis of the images that she was looking at and de <laughs> determining uh, the motion of uh, stars and galaxies and so on and so forth. Now, the expanding universe wasn't really understood. It went against Einstein's notion of a stable state inter uh, universe, but you know, Einstein adjusted. Uh, but the point of the matter is that no one knew why the universe was expanding, except everything was flying, you know, you know willy-nilly away from one another, uh, but it's very easily understood under CPT because the universe is expanding because the universe is expanding because of quantum fluctuations and quantum fluctuations are taking place everywhere all the time right around me. There one just took place right now. There's one there. They're really small. You don't notice. Uh, but the quantum fluctuations take place everywhere. And uh, because they take place everywhere, you know, things get strange. The rules, the speed of light doesn't apply to the expansion of the universe because, you know, these quantum fluctuations don't know anything about the speed of light. They don't care. They're just doing their thing. And the doing their thing creates space. Uh, one other interesting observation, by the way. Uh, about uh, the fact that the universe is expanding faster than the speed of light. There really is no certainty that the speed of light is the upper limit. We know that there is an absolute zero in temperature. Some argue that there's an absolute maximum temperature, which is the speed of light. Uh, but there also are others who say, nah, there's no maximum temperature. Uh, so, uh, uh, what's the relevance of the speed of light? Well, uh, photons are considered to be massless particles, but actually, how could they be? They must have mass. They have energy. So, let's say it's a really puny amount of energy, you know, considerably smaller than uh, an electron, uh, but, you know, not... Uh, puny. Uh, the photon's tiny, but it does have mass, but it's regarded as massless, and that therefore it can travel through space at the maximum allowable speed. Now is that true? Or is it the case that the photon, which has a tiny amount of mass, 
travels at the speed that it travels, which is referred to as the speed of light because the photon is a light emitter. And that just happens to be the speed of the photon, but if there were smaller particles, or if the particle uh, that is the photon had less mass, it might have a higher speed. The speed of light would be higher, depending on the mass. And of course, remember, there is no fixed speed of light. It varies on, depending on frequency. Uh, the higher the frequency, the greater the velocity. Uh, so what, what does that have to do with everything that we're talking about? I'm not sure anymore. But the point is, there's a lot that we know and a lot that we don't know. And in physics 9, 6 times, uh, or physics 6, 9, there, I don't remember what I call this anymore. It's useful to explore these things in a philosophical way and also in a manner that doesn't challenge the audience. I'm not throwing Hermitians or Hamiltonians or Lagrange points at you here. I'm not forcing you to look at a series of calculations to intimidate you into thinking that uh, you can't understand the universe or that physics is, uh, you know, the holy grail, <laughs> ivory tower of an intellectual activity. Sure it is, but it's not something that you can't embrace even on a fairly straightforward level. So stay with me as I take you through the world of physics nine, six times. Bonjour la visite and have a happy day. You know, Cannabis is legal in Canada. But it wasn't always. <laughs> Do you know that in 2012 I was busted for 4.7 kilograms of weed? Now the prosecutor did admit that, you know, there's a bit of soil in there because they took the whole bloody plants, right? So I had a few plants. But 4.7 kilograms, man, that's like major drug bust. So, you know, I'm a jailbird uh, for something that is now legal. Believe me, you don't know the work it took to grow weed. It was incredibly difficult. Oh, the spider mites and the smell. Oh. Now you just... They deliver it to you, it's unbelievably cheap. So, have a high, 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 high. And you know, don't take anything I say seriously, I'm full of shit. Uh, the stuff I talk about concerning physics, yeah, it's the philosophy of physics, but you know, some things we know and some things we don't. And the one thing we can be sure about is that, you know, I'm smoking weed constantly. I'm destroying brain cells faster than uh, they can be replaced. And when you reach a certain age, it's a one-way street anyhow. So, you know, I'm kind of babbling and gurgling, and you're doing your best to be kind and watch. Uh, nah, I got some good stuff for you. I promise.